Good morning, church. Welcome, everybody. It is so good to see all of you guys that are attending here in person, as well as everybody that's tuning in online. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being over here and uh, enjoying the presence of God with us. Amen. Man, we had an amazing time on Friday at Vision Night. Everybody that was at Vision Night, say yee. Few. <laughs> but it was amazing. Thank you so much for being there. And uh, God did some amazing stuff. Um, you know, we, we got to uh, experience the move of God uh, and receive from God the word that we had for this year. And that word is God things. That that phrase is God things. We can't wait for that. Uh, I hope you guys got your merch, your new Commission Church merch on Vision Night. Uh, we have some cool t-shirts that Justina designed. Uh, uh, who, who has a t-shirt on today? Anyone has a t-shirt on today? I don't see anyone. Okay. Lakshmi, come over here real quick. Come over here real quick. I, I don't have the t-shirt on. Uh, so I'm going to show everyone what this t-shirt's all about. And... Um, and and wear your mask too. There you go. Okay. So we, we gave out some cool merc over the last few days. Lakshmi, uh, Lakshmi has this fancy headset on her. So come over here. Stand over here. That's our our shirt. It's, it says God things. And that's our theme for this year. We're going to see the miraculous. We're going to see the amazing. Uh, Justina is the one that designed this shirt. And she designed last year's shirt too. And she designed this shirt. Uh, get your merc. If you weren't at uh, service uh, last week, uh, sorry, no, sorry, uh, Vision Night, get your merc uh, this week. Contact us. Let us know if you want that. Look at that mask. Our team made those masks. Janice and Sonia and Aaliyah, they worked so hard to make sure that we produce these masks and have it for everybody. So we want to make sure that you have it. Thank you. I just wanted to embarrass you, Lakshmi. You're always behind the scenes. So uh, Lakshmi is one of the people that works so hard behind the scenes uh, to make sure that you guys receive an online experience. So uh, thank God for what God is doing. Uh, I am excited to share this word that God has put in my heart, okay? Uh, we have been in a, uh, a season where God has been speaking to us from different people. Uh, Mike spoke to us last Sunday, our, one of our overseers. And uh, this Sunday, uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to lay a foundation, uh, kind of give you an outlook of what our next series is going to look like. Uh, I've been uh, in a few weeks of prayer and uh, seeking the face of God as to what God wants to share with us and speak to us as a church in this next season as we look forward to God things, as we have called it. Uh, in short, for those of y'all who are not there at Vision Night, what essentially God things means is it means the miraculous. It means the, 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 what no eye has seen, no ears heard, no heart has imagined. That's what God things means means. And, and we want to see God things happen. And what that means is not human understanding, not human works, not human uh, knowledge, but it can only be done through God. If there's something that you're praying for as a family, as a person, it could be a future, it could be your finances, a job, whatever it is, your education, let us believe together that God can do God things. Amen. That he could do only what he can do. And, and, and we would be in awe and astonishment of what he's about to do. So what uh, we're, we're actually going to start in a study of Thessalonians uh, here um, next week. And what I wanted to do today is kind of lay a foundation for it. Uh, our new series is going to be called Upside Down, Upside Down. But today's message, I titled it, Turn It, Turn It. And it would be an explanation as to why we're calling our series that begins next week, Upside Down. Does that make sense? So instead of me giving you a backdrop next week, I want to dive right into Thessalonians instead of me giving you a backdrop next week. So this week, I'll give you uh, the backstory from the, uh, from, from the book of Acts uh, as Luke writes it and accounts for it as to why we will call Thessalonians uh, the, the series, why we would call the series uh, in, uh, Upside Down, all right? Uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 1 to 9 is the passage of scripture that we're going to refer to today. And bear with me as I give you some facts, as I teach this morning. There's, there's going to be a lot of facts. There's going to be a lot of teaching that I'm going to do. So journey with me today. It's going to be a good study. All right. So uh, in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, uh, you know, Paul and Silas are doing this missionary journey, if you may, jumping from city to city to city. But 
what we're going to do is we are going to read Psalm, uh, sorry, uh, Acts 17, and we're going to juxtapose that with another passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 6, right? A few passages before where this movement began. So reading from verse number 1, this is what the Bible says. Now, when they had passed through Aphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women in verse five. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, who happened to be in parenthesis, who happened to be the host of Paul and Silas at that time, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Verse six. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men. Now, I want you to underline this verse. Now, this verse is going to be the reason why we are going to call Thessalonians upside down. All right. This verse says this, underline this verse. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. They were enraged, they were furious, they were angry, and they said, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Verse seven, and Jason is, had, has received them, and they, all, they, they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus, and, and the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken the money as security from Jason and, and the rest, they let them go. Now, pray with me real quick. Father, would you speak to us through this word? Uh, help us to understand and lay context to what you want to teach us over the next few weeks, God. Make it simple, make it understandable. Give me the ability to break this down to the best of my ability. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. Now, even though we will be talking uh, from the Upside Down series beginning next week, it is imperative for us as a body of Christ who is learning the word to be able to understand the implications that surround this whole sermon series. And it begins in the book of Acts. We'll go to Acts chapter 6 in just a little bit. But today when we implore Acts 17, we are introduced to people who Jesus himself encouraged to pick up crosses if they wanted to follow him. You remember that, that verse in the Bible where Jesus looked at his disciples and said, hey, if you, wanna, if you wanna follow me, you have to pick up your crosses. Jesus called people to take up their crosses and lose their lives if they wish to follow him. And, and Mark chapter eight reminds us of that. The life of the apostle Paul is the one that gives us this concrete example of what exactly that means. There are many people in the scriptures, apostles, many of them were, that were beheaded for their faith. There were a lot of things that happened to them. But they did that to follow the instruction of Jesus to say, hey, you got to go to any extreme. And Paul's example and Paul's life is a very good example of that. Paul and Silas were characterized by the people of Thessalonica, uh, Thessal uh, Thessalonica with a most interesting characterization. And that characterization is these are the guys that flipped the world upside down. The world as we know it, the world as we're used to it, the culture as we're used to it, the culture as we know it, right? Whatever that might entail, these are the guys that are responsible. A group of the guys are responsible to come right into our culture, come into our belief systems, come into our synagogues, come into our churches and create an uproar. They didn't like that. They didn't like it because it damaged the way they looked at certain things. They, it damaged the way they looked at religion. And today, verse in, in, in verse 6 of chapter number 17 is the verse that I'm going to use as a jumping off point. I want to use that as a, uh, as a springboard of so sorts. Because at the end of, of the verse, the people, right, in determining the characterization of Paul and Silas, they choose some interesting words. 
They say, these are the men who have turned the world upside down and they have come here also. And that literally means they've been in other places, right? We at Thessalonica have heard that they have done exploits in other places. They have gone into synagogues. They have gone into places of worship and then they have told people about Jesus and they're turning to Jesus, all these people. And man, we need to be wary about these people. Now, that's an interesting definition of these two people, that, that they are people that turn the world upside down. Now, if you have to ask me, that should be our conviction as Christians. We are called as Christians and believers and witnesses to go into our world that God has called us into and turn the world upside down. Some would say upside down. It's amazing that the impact was so great that the people said they're turning it upside down, right? That's tremendous. I mean, there, there are people, you know, who, who actually live their entire lives and, and the world doesn't even know that they're alive, right? And I hope I'm not talking to some of y'all that, that, that fall in that category today. There are Christians who have absolutely no effect on anything, but they still call themselves Christians. And this book of Thessalonians that we're about to study next week on is this book that's about to explore and that we're going to explore what Jesus means by saying, hey, prepare for the second coming of Jesus. You got to do everything in your capacity to turn the world that you live in upside down. This is deeper than what it actually looks like on surface level. Uh, you know, contrary, contrary to what popular teaching is on this verse, this upside down theology or this upside down characterization of these people that were called to be witnesses didn't start overnight. It was a process. It started a long time ago. What do I mean? What is, what is it that makes a man or a woman who, who, who really loves Jesus to go out into the world that God has put them in and shake the world up and flip the world upside down for Jesus? I'm asking you today, what have you done uh, this last week or this last month? All right, let me be gracious to you since 2021 started. Let me be even more gracious to you. In the last five years, how many of you can, 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 can honestly look at me and say, hey, pastor, this is what I've done. And this is what I've done. And this is what I've done to make sure that the world that God has put me in, I have done everything in my capacity to flip it. What do I mean by that? To make a difference, to make a change, right? We'll talk about that as we go on. Well, if you ask me, what, what, it, what does it take a man or a woman to shake the world? The characterization is right here in the book of Acts. Not just in chapter number 17, but even if you go to chapter number six. My first point, I want to leave four points with you today. Write this down. I want you all to take notes throughout this series. Uh, write this down. And if you're attending in person next week, uh, I have a surprise for somebody. Uh, one or two people is going to, probably going to get a surprise from me. So uh, I want y'all to take notes uh, and gives you more reason to come and uh, attend uh, in-person services uh, next week. Four points I want to leave with you. Write this down. Point number one, God can use anybody. What does it take a man or a woman to flip the world that God has put them in. I'm not talking about the whole universe. I'm not talking about all the continents of the world because you're like, man, I'm nobody. What can I do to the whole world? But man, what about your world? What about what God has put you in? And it begins in the mind. It begins in the heart where you have to tell yourself, God can use anyone. God can use me. He used a murderer in Paul to turn his world upside down. But, the, the, but the, the amazing thing is it didn't start with Paul. Theologian and speaker and uh, uh, this amazing man of God, J.D. Uh, Greer, that, that I often listen to, talking to seminary students around a year ago, argued that Jesus' plan for reaching the world was not gathering in large groups or it wasn't in in, 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 in listening to one prophetic teacher teach the whole world or in mega churches is what his argument is. His plan, he goes on to say, revolves around raising ordinary people that people don't even know about and raising them out, empowering them, filling them with the Holy Spirit, knowing that they are powerful, that they have the ability, that they have the grace and sending them out. In chapter number 17 and verse number 6, it doesn't begin with Paul and Silas, even though we're reading about Paul and Silas, it doesn't begin with Paul and Silas. In fact, in chapter number 6 of Acts, it begins with a man called Stephen. Someone say Stephen. An ordinary guy. 
A guy that nobody would suspect would go into the world and start a momentum that would completely transform the landscape of Christianity in the world. An ordinary guy. He wasn't an apostle. An ordinary dude. Till Acts 6, the gospel had not left Jerusalem. I want you to hear this. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit moves in the upper room. The power of the Holy Spirit moves. The people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you know, the word of God is still with them going into all the world, into all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world, right? They've received this promise, commission church, the commission that we have, right? They have received this commission. But till chapter number 6, there is no record of anyone leaving Jerusalem. They're still in their comfort zones, meeting in small groups, singing Kumbaya. Nothing wrong with that. But they weren't fulfilling what God called them to do. Am I talking to somebody today? It's so easy for us as a church to be comfortable. It's, it's so easy for us to have a vision and have a mission and be comfortable where we are saying somebody else will do it. It takes a lot of audacity and guts and boldness for people to step up and say, man, God can use me. God can choose me. You know what Stephen did? Stephen was voluntold right, by, by, by the apostles, by the church elders to deliver food to widows so the apostles could spend that time to teach instead of walking around meals on wheels. That's what Stephen did. He literally was the DoorDash. He was literally the Uber Eats of the first century church. Am I talking to somebody? He would go knocking on widows' houses. He would go to the disenfranchised and he would go and be a powerful witness to them. He wasn't an author. He wasn't like Paul. He isn't somebody that you're going to hear about. He wasn't a worship leader or an apostle. He was a simple guy that carried a powerful witness. And the difference that it had was he was filled with the Holy Spirit. There is something amazing that happens when somebody knows that the Spirit inside of them, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them, is what gives them the ability to be faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. He was a soup mobile guy. He was the DoorDash, the Uber Eats guy, like I said, who rang, on, who rang people's doorbells and said, I'm here. I'm here to serve you. That's who he was. He wasn't the popular dude. Acts 6 and verse 7 tells us Stephen did his job. That's what the Bible says. If you go to Acts chapter 6 and verse number 7, here's, here's, here's what the Bible says. He says, um, it says, and, and the word of God continued to increase and, and the number of disciples multiplied great in Jerusalem uh, and, 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 and great many of the priests became obedient to the faith, right? But, but, in, in, uh, but, but Stephen j did his job so well, right? If you go on reading that, that, that passage, the Bible talks about how he, he, he did his job so well and his witness was full of the spirit that many people, including Jewish priests, turned to Jesus right? Jewish authorities turned to him. It was amazing that all he did was deliver food. Come on, someone say deliver food. It wasn't significant. He wasn't on stage. He wasn't in front of the camera. He wasn't somebody that people knew. He was in the backgrounds doing God things. He was in the background doing things that people didn't even recognize, just giving out food, but people saw the power of God in him. It could be the way he spoke. It could be the way he treated people. It could be the way that he shared Jesus with the passion that he had, doing insignificant things. Someone say insignificant things. Never underestimate the insignificant that you think is not making a change. But without your knowledge, God is doing miraculous because of the little that you think that you're doing that doesn't make a difference. It's amazing when you read this. In verse number 10, the Bible says they couldn't withstand the wisdom or the spirit with which he was speaking. That's how powerful it was. But in Acts chapter 7, the same man, the Bible says, just because of the impact that he was making, people could stand him. The Sanhedrin couldn't stand him. The people saw that this man, this one man who was insignificant, were bringing people to Jesus right, left, and center. It wasn't the apostles. That's not what the Bible says. Yeah, the apostles were teaching. But he was the one that the apostles were sending out. I can do all the teaching on Sunday mornings, but man, if, if God doesn't look at each one of you and give you the conviction to go out into the world, invite people to this church, invite people to churches around over here, tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, nothing will happen in this world. The world will stay where it is without any results. Because here's what I'm, I'm trying to tell you. Like we're, 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 a lot of our churches, we're trying to sell a product that, that really people are not interested in. We're, we're trying to reach the unchurched. We're trying to reach the, the, the people that don't know about Jesus, but we're, we're wanting them to come in over here. 
growing up, I had a mosque right next to my house, probably like two minutes walking distance from my house. No matter what they did, I wouldn't go there. They might have free food. I wouldn't go there. They might have a celebration for Eid or for Ramzan. I wouldn't go there, right? I, I, I love some Muslim biryani. I love it. Trust me, I do. It's delicious. They can cook great. But there was nothing that would happen that would take me there. And the reason simply is because that's not a place that I really wanted to go to. We're trying to reach people who really don't want to come to church. And we're trying to do stuff in here, waiting for people to come in. And God's like, they're not going to come. Some of y'all have to go and do regular things. You have to do insignificant things. Things like loving. Things like, you know, sharing the gospel. Things like smiling. Things like treating them like human beings. Things like accepting them. Things like, you know, looking at them, not in a judgmental way, but looking at them and not through piercing eyes, but with loving eyes, showing them that there's something about you that that's different. In Acts chapter 7, they see that this one man is making a ruckus within Jerusalem and, and all the surrounding places. And he's like, man, something has to be done. They drag him to the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. Stephen starts preaching the longest. They, they say, this man is accused of this. And Stephen seizes the opportunity. He's like, man, I got a stage finally. All this time, I didn't have a stage. Finally, he has a stage. He stands. Oh, man. He delivers one of the longest sermons in the book of Acts, right? He, and, and all he's doing is he's pointing them to the Old Testament. He's pointing them to Jesus. And he's saying, guys, open your eyes. I want to tell you why people are loving this message. It's because I'm pointing them to the one that was promised to us. We're the Jews waiting for the Messiah. And Jesus is that Messiah. And the sermon climax is in verse number 54. If you go to verse number 54, the Bible says this. It says, uh, go with me there. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And, and he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out to the city and stoned him. And the, witness and, the, uh, and the witness laid down their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died, is what the Bible says. And in verse number eight, there shouldn't be a gap there, but verse number, uh, chapter number eight and verse number one, Saul approved of this execution. Saul was standing right by Stephen when this was happening. This is when it started, not with Saul and, and, and uh, not with Saul uh, in, in chapter number 17. This is the moment. Now listen to this. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. I want you to catch this. Read that verse again. It said, and because of this, okay, because of Stephen's witness, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered to the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Where have you heard the word Judea and Samaria before? To the ends of the earth. The commission, where he said, hey, I want you to get out of your comfort zones, and I want you to go to the ends of the earth. It was persecution that propelled them to say, hey, let's get out of here. We can't stay here. Sometimes we look at the bad stuff that happens to us and we're like, God, why me? And God's like, because you're in this place for way too long and I got to get, get you out of the comfort zone sometimes and I got to open up new doors for you and I got to do what I intend for you to do and you're just sitting there thinking that everything's okay and nothing's going wrong, so why do you have to get out of there? And God sometimes have to force you out of those comfort zones that you're in. Am I talking to somebody here? The first time after that mention, we're hearing the words Judea and Samaria. And you know who went? The Bible says, and they all dispersed. They all ran away and took the gospel with them, except the apostles. Here's what I want you to get at. This is, this, this is very, very important. The apostles were not the ones that were scattered. In verse number four of chapter number eight, the Bible says this. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. 
the word those means not the apostles, not the pastors, not the preachers, not the ones that were committed. They were the ones that were listening to the word, that were filled with the word. All of this, these were the people that the Bible says were scattered. And what did they do? Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. There it is. The first time the gospel leaves the borders of Jerusalem and not a single apostle has left the city. Instead, who has left the city? Regular, ordinary people that thought that they didn't have a stage. Come on, somebody, this is good. That is how we are going to win the world for Jesus. That is how we're going to turn Plano upside down. That's how we're going to turn Richardson. Uh, come on, somebody. is by getting out of our comfort zones and saying, I got to do something. The, the, the restless feeling that we have. What am I doing for the expansion of the kingdom of God? What am I doing at my workplace? What am I doing with my friend circles? What am I doing? Are you in this quandary saying, God, I really want to do something for the kingdom of God? And the Bible says those who were scattered, being scattered didn't stop them from preaching the gospel. Being persecuted didn't stop them from preaching the gospel. You know, that's the first time, not, not a single, and the gospel leaves the borders of, uh, borders of Jerusalem and not a single apostle left the city. It was the ordinary, it was the regular people whose lives were changed by the gospel message. Can I tell you something, church? If your lives are changed by the gospel message, don't just sit and do nothing by it. If you profess yourself to be Christians who love Jesus, why are you keeping this message to yourself? Oh, brother, I'm just afraid of rejection. I don't, I don't know if, you know if people will accept me. I don't know if I have the answers. Well, come up to your pastors. Talk to them. Tell them, hey, you want a class in answering people that don't know Jesus. We're going to be doing some small groups about that, about how you witness about Jesus. The world was about to be turned upside down by some ordinary people who worked regular nine to fives and attended life groups and worshiped with other believers. These are the people, not the pastors, not the word. No, nah, it was, someone say regular people. You know, the Bible goes, I'm not going to read this verse, but the Bible actually says the Antioch, the church in Antioch, one of the first churches, it was planted by some brothers. Quote, unquote. Just like the Bible says, it was planted by some brothers. Their names were not even mentioned because, you know, Luke was like, you're probably not even going to hear of these people anymore. But that's who planted the church. I pray that church planters will rise up from Commission Church, that we will send out people that will go and have the, 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 the boldness to say, God is calling me. If it's to Vietnam, it's Vietnam. If it's South America, if it's in America, if it's in Seattle or New Mexico, wherever it is, if God is calling me or South Dallas, whatever it is, if God is calling me, I want to go. The church in Rome, the Bible says everyone thinks, oh, it's Peter or, 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 or it's Paul. No, and the brothers started the church in, in, in Rome. The Bible says that when, when, when Paul arrived in Rome, the brothers were there to say, hey, Paul, it's so good to see you. It's, we've heard a lot about you. Welcome to our church. It's these regular people that were scattered that went and started planning churches. Somebody once said this, there are people who watch things happen and there are people who make things happen and there are people who don't know what's happening. My question, very sincerely, Commission Church, is which category do you fall in? These people, the regular folk, the unrecognized folk, were the ones that made things happening happen. Every time they took a step, the world shook. They had an effect. It mattered. What they did mattered. What they said mattered because they knew inside of them a secret. The secret was this. I can be used by God. I don't need to have fashionable language. I don't need to be well-educated. I don't need to go to seminary or Bible school or be a worship leader for the people of God to know who God is. I can do whatever I can with the ability that I can share my testimony with them. Just show them the love of Jesus and they will know Jesus. What is it that makes a man who really shakes the world? What is it that makes a woman who goes out there and turns the world and flips the world upside down? Again, I want you to think about your world today. One, God can use anyone. The knowledge that you and I can be used by God no matter who we are. Take this down, point number two. What is it that makes a man or a woman really shake and flip their world? The boldness that they carried. What made them do what they did, be it Stephen, Paul, or Silas, was the boldness with which they walked. 
In Acts 17, verse number one, the Bible says, now when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of this of the Jews. Now, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to go as much as we can. Okay, uh, I know that uh, I, I started this message at around 10:40, and I don't want to. I don't want to go. So if if I have to break this down into at least two parts, uh, we're going to do that before next week. Does that make sense? Okay, so even though we're scheduled to start our series next week, I want us to listen to this message before we begin our series. All right, so we'll make this a part of our, of our series if we have to break this down. But the Bible says this, they came to Thessal uh, Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. The second thing is they had boldness. The reason they were able to flip their world upside down is because these, this intense sense of boldness inside of them. At this point in time, in chapter number 17, and if you read, go back and read verse chapter number 16, you would see how Paul and Silas is fleeing from this place called Philippi, right? They're, they're fleeing from there. You know, they're, 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 uh, the wounds of, uh, on Paul's back, you know, from the beating in Philippi is probably still fresh. It's probably still raw. And they've been hurting now, right? And now he's rushing to Thessalonica, which is 94 miles away. Right? There are two cities, Amphipolis and Apollonia, which is 30 miles, 30 miles right, apart. And there's another 30 miles for them to reach this place. right? And, and, and now they're in the capital of Macedonia to share about the same Jesus. It's amazing. Man, you just got beat, dude. Like, isn't that a cue for you to just go back home, take, it, take rest, lick your wounds, recover, and say, okay, when people are not looking, when people are not searching for me, let me go back and share the gospel, right? Like, think about it. Any ordinary person will do that. Hollywood will tell you that's the, that's the wise thing to do. Lay what? Low. If you are somebody that's most wanted, you're not just going to show up, right? And, and show everybody yourself. You're going to be undercover. You are going to go undercover. You're, you're, you're going to be like, you know, I'm a fugitive. I want to make sure that I'm not seen in public places. But these two dudes are crazy, y'all. They're like, we don't care. We don't care what happens to us. They're like, we got to put ourselves in places. Our time on earth is very limited. And unless we go from place to place, they are the kind of people that said, man, my time on earth is not guaranteed. I don't know if I'm going to live tomorrow because that's the gospel I'm preaching. And they were not bold to proclaim. Still fresh of the beating and the wounds in Philippi, they traveled 90 miles. And this would have probably taken them a few days to get there. I know they probably had horses and Paul was a tent maker. So, you know, they had money and he was a businessman. But along with his business, he was sharing the gospel. And it would have taken them a few days. But immediate rebound of saying, I got beat. But it doesn't change the gospel message. Here's, here's what I want you to get at, church. Let the disappointment and rejection of your experience uh, or, or your experience that, that you experienced in one arena fuel the passion for revival in the next arena. I'm going to say that again. Let your disappointment and rejection you experienced in one arena fuel the passion for a revival in your next arena. God can use your pain to motivate you. That's what fueled these guys. You know, David Livingston is the one that once said this. He said, I am prepared to go anywhere as long as it is forward. It's amazing. One of the most known, renowned uh, missionaries of, the, of the, 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 the latter years. In and through Africa, he went. He said, man, I'm prepared to go anywhere that God wants me to go as long as it's forward. Thessalonica boasted uh, of a strategically located uh, harbor that was filled with ships that uh, from throughout the Roman Empire, throughout, uh, throughout the place, people would come over there. It was a very strategic location. And Paul, Silas, and Timothy walked into this major city port of, of around 2,000 people with this revolutionary message of the cross of Jesus Christ. What did Stephen do? Stephen had the knowledge of, of the power that was inside of them, the power of the Holy Spirit that was inside of him. The reason he was bold, the reason that he would have been able to take the arrows that were thrown at him, he was able to take the stones that were thrown at him because he understood the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
I'm telling you something, your pain that you're going through will not measure up to the, the, the pain that Jesus went through on the cross. And when you understand what he did on the cross and the pain that he took on for you, man, you would want to preach this gospel message to everybody that you meet. What is it that really makes a man or a woman shake the world? One is, we talked about it before, God can use anyone. Two, the boldness that they carried. Three, it was the message that they carried. The message that they carried. The Bible says, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. It was amazing. It says, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. The, the first thing he does as soon as he reaches the city is where? He goes to the synagogue. Because more than anything else, he wanted the Jews to understand that this Messiah that they've been waiting for was Jesus Christ. They had a hard time understanding that. He first went to a synagogue. This was crucial. There was, not, there was not a synagogue in Philippi. And at the moment he got this opportunity in Macedonia to, to go and, and to, the, to the synagogue, he seized the opportunity and he went right in because the Jewish population over there was big enough for him to go and share this gospel. Paul actually, whenever he went to a major city, he established the custom of preaching to the Jews first. It could have been in the Pisidian church, right? Uh, in, in, in Pisidian Antioch in chapter number 13 or Iconium in chapter number 14 or Thessalonica in chapter number 17 here, Berea in chapter number 17 and uh, Athens again in chapter number 17, Corinth in, in chapter number 18, Ephesus in chapter number 18 and 19. He always made sure he would go to the synagogue. He did this because he always had an open door over there. He was a Jew. And there was always an open door for him to go and proclaim about what he wanted to proclaim. And he knew who, wherever there was an open door, there was not going to be conflict. There was not going to be anybody that opposed him. People knew him all over the place. And he was like, this is the perfect opportunity. I want you to think about the places that you have a platform. What are the places in your life that you have an open door? I'm not talking about, you know, big stages. I'm not talking about conventions, crusades. I'm talking about the world that you're in. What are the places that you have an open door? Do you walk into your open doors and are you confident and bold enough to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because the other thing, you may have boldness, but that boldness comes from the fact that you have a message that you're holding in your hands. A message that's life transforming your life. Paul, the Bible says this, you know, he, he said, man, I have this open door and I can't wait to walk into it and, and preach. Now, it's, it's amazing. Aren't we afraid more often to share the gospel with people that we actually know? That was me. Like, I remember as, as a church, we would do these outreaches where we would go and we would share the gospel with people in the streets. We would ask them if we could pray for them, you know, and things like that. And I would be so scared. Now, honest truth, God's honest truth. I'd be so scared to actually go and, 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 and to places where I knew my friends were. And I'm like, man, only if somebody saw me, I'd be so freaked out. I'd be so scared. I wouldn't even know how to talk to them because these are the same people I see at school. Sometimes it was because, man, I, I acted a different way of school. And I'm like, oh, this guy's coming and tell me about this Jesus. And I'm like, oh, man, I, I don't want to show my face to them it's so much more harder to share the gospel with somebody that we know but it should be the opposite if you ask me it should be the opposite because that's somebody that you know you have an open door with you know that they're not going to shut the door they're going to be like oh i know you tell me what you have to tell me after they hear you out they might close the door but you still had an open door that you could walk into Here's what I want, I want us to understand right it's it's important paul spent three sabbaths it wasn't easy it wasn't a, okay, one revival meeting and that is it. People are going to be changed and transformed and oh, baptisms happen and this and that. Yep, it happened when Peter, when Peter came and preached later on. That happened and we see that, right? But here, when Paul is preaching, man, he had to spend time with them. Don't give up on the people that you share the gospel with. It took three weeks for, the, for, for Paul to drill this message and it was probably the same message over and over again. And you know what the message was? Guys, think about the Old Testament, the same Old Testament that we read in, on the Sabbath day inside the synagogue, the same message, the same Jesus that we've been waiting for. This is the Jesus because here was a problem. The message was he, this is the Messiah that came and died on the cross. And the Jews could not wrap their mind around this, that our Messiah would die on the cross. And Paul was like, guys, this is he. Accept him. 
because only through him there is eternal life. Even though he was there three Sabbaths or three weeks, uh, three weekends preaching to the Jews, he stayed for around six weeks preaching and even working because as we know, like I said earlier, he made tents for a living. He was a tent maker. He was a businessman. You know, Paul worked hard at his ministry and so should everyone who claims to be a true minister of Jesus Christ. An excuse, oh, I have work. Oh, I have a business to run. I have a nine to five. That's not an excuse. I'm too busy is not an excuse. Come on, am I talking to somebody here? I know I'm stepping on some toes today, but I am too busy. I have too many children. I have this, I have that. I have, you know, a lot of stuff going on. Pastor Oshers, you won't even imagine. I have no time for outreaches. I have no time to share the gospel. Please, please go tell that to Jesus. Like, I, I don't know why people feel like they need to come and justify why they don't have time. Like to that, I, if you do it, you do it for Jesus. You're not doing it for me. Yeah, it's great. We give you the opportunity to serve. We give you the opportunity to do this, that. But if you're, if you're not available, that's between you and Jesus. You tell him why you're not available. You tell him why you're busy. The Bible says he reasoned with them. In 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. you got to be courageous, fam. So important to be courageous. Right, Luke? It's so important to be courageous, brother. In moments of adversity, in moments of, of, of pain, in moments that you don't know where you're heading, remember, you have a message. You have a gospel that is so powerful, that is so potent, and all you got to do is open your mouth and share this message, y'all. You need to have a message and speak the truth. There's so many, there are a lot of people with a lot of boldness and a lot of courage, but they just don't have anything to say. You have to have both. You can have boldness, but you've got to have the word as well. And that's what made them different is that they preached the word of God. It wasn't a whole lot of noise. It wasn't a whole lot of blah, 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 blah. It wasn't just the Holy Spirit moving. No, they preached the word of God. It wasn't a, oh my gosh, we spoke in tongues and let's just make sure the tongues are what we do from now on. The filling of the Holy Spirit. Let's have revival meetings. No, no, no. They still spend time teaching the word of God because the word of God is what can change people's hearts. Guys, we have such a powerful tool that can change lives, transform people, and we don't use it. You know, I'm amazed how courageous the cults are and some of these weird religions in the world. They're so courageous. They'll come knocking on your door saying, sir, can I talk to you? They say, no, I don't have time. But sir, do you have five minutes? They're, they're so persistent. Look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at the Mormons. But yet we're here. Go in there for it and do what, what you got to do. And we're like, the missionaries will do that. The pastors will do that. The apostles, no. Can I, can I be honest with you? Don't get upset with me. Don't get upset with me. I love outreaches. I love, you know, going out. I've been a missionary. I've been, you know, I've, I've witnessed. And, and I will do it again tomorrow. But can I be very honest with you about the biblical truth of the fact? I am not the one that God is calling to go out there. Now, this might seem, seem brutal. It might seem, you know, blunt. It might seem, what? What are you talking about? It's, it's the people that God has given us as pastors the authority to empower when I'm preaching here, I'm empowering you, Rince. I'm empowering you, Luke, to say, you know what? I just can't keep quiet. What I hear today, you and I have the responsibility to take this and take it to the world that we live in. We're not, because they have not heard this message and they won't hear this message unless it's from you, Priya. They won't. They won't. They will never encounter. If you're just waiting for that to happen to them, it would not happen. You have to take that step forward to do it because what you have in your hand is just not boldness, but you need to have the word of God. Let the word of God do what the word of God is good at doing. Paul had a dialogue with the Jews using the scriptures. It was not a formal sermon, but a discussion and, and answering their questions. Are you equipped to answer questions? Oh, brother, I don't know. I'm so scared. Read it up. We have Google. You go to Google for everything else. You go to Siri for everything else. 
Why can't you just open up Google and say, hey, there's so many resources out there that can empower you and strengthen you to actually preach the gospel, to share the gospel with Muslims, to share the gospel. There, there are resources more than any other time in history today at a snap of a finger, at the click of a mouse. Please do not make the excuse of saying, I am not equipped. Our pastor doesn't going to do a good job of equipping us. Man, do it yourself, Right? We all do well to emulate Paul's pattern, you know, but first we need to be sure and understand what we believe in. Do we even believe this word that we are about to share? Church, that's the thing. You and I will never make a difference. We will never make a change in the world that we're in if we ourselves don't believe this message of the cross. Has this message transformed your life? Has this message transformed my life? I can only be a carrier of this message if it has transformed my life. You know, in Romans 1.18, it says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to them that believe, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Man, it was a passion for this message. It was a passion Stephen preached boldly from, from, because, because of the passion that he had, right? That's what I want to get at today, y'all. The passion is so important. I have so much more to go, but I think I'm at that half point right now that I'm going to close this message off. It took a lot more time than I expected, but I'm going to be proper and better with time. Worship team, come back up. And what I want to do is I want to pause right there. Lakshmi will will we'll roll the notes next week. But, uh, but for now, let's pause right there. I, I can't wait to share the rest of this message because it's powerful. I've just given you how many points did I give you? Two? Three points? Three points. I got to give you one more point and then we'll close off. But it's a powerful representation of what God wants to share with us. And what we'll do is we'll start with First Thessalonians next week after we finish this off. We'll start with verse number three next week. We just explored two verses today. But in these two points, my question is, what has God spoken to you about today? What challenge has invigorated your spirit today? What is it that has moved your heart today? Who, I, I need you to identify your world. My world, what does my world entail, Robin? What does your world entail? My spouse, my parents, my family, my job, my responsibilities, my ministry. single people that are listening to me that, that entails a person that you're probably in a relationship with today friends of yours that don't know Jesus young adults that are listening to me it probably represents the people that you have influence over I'm talking about the people your girlfriends and boyfriends that call you on the phone saying hey I need help right now the people that call you for advice the people that Man, you have no idea the people that you have authority and that you have power over. Because the number of people that call you and are influenced, you are an influencer today. Do you know that? That's one of the most, that was one of the most popular words in 2020, the word influencer. So many social media influencers in our world. Forget social media. You are people of influence in the circles that God has put you in. You don't even know it. Identify the people that actually listen to you, people that would actually give you a, a year. I'm not talking about the people that ignore you. I'm just talking about the people that just give you ear. Are these people, are these people that will give you two minutes of your time? In your conversation with them, you can make a difference in their lives. You can revolve your entire conversation about Jesus and they wouldn't even know about it. But inadvertently, they heard about Jesus through you. But brother, is that deception? Isn't that deception? I'm going to deceive people. Right? No, it's not deception. That should be a motivation. How can I make Jesus the central focus of it? You know what? There's something I decided when I started ministry here at Commission Church is that there's not one Sunday and you would probably ask me, isn't that normal for every pastor? No. There'd be not even one Sunday 
that would go by that I have the opportunity to preach on this stage that I will not preach about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. I find it a way in every sermon of mine, and you can go back two years back from when we started this church. Every opportunity I get, I try my best to give an opportunity for people to receive Jesus in their lives. But Pastor, you have a stage, you have a mic. I do, but God has given me that ability to empower you and give you that strength and and propel you and tell you that you can do it too. Because that's who started the church, y'all. Ordinary people whose names are not, we only know about the Paul. We only know about the apostle. Oh, I'm not an apostle. I'm not a, no, 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 no. It's it's more to it than that, fam. It's more to it than that. You have absolutely no idea the power that people like you and me have. You know, Paul says this. He says, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. That's powerful. That's so powerful. He's like, man, I, I'm not myself. I'm hopeless if I can't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Identify your world. I want to know what your world is, and I want to know if you're doing due diligence, if you're doing your responsibility to flip it. Someone say, flip it. Are you doing your responsibility to turn it? Someone say, turn it. Because here's what that means. I'm going to close with this. Here's what that means. In the Garden of Eden, God created everything right side up. When man fell to sin, when we went under the bondage of sin, we went from right side up to upside down. We started viewing the world from a worldly perspective. Am I talking to someone? Not with a spiritual eyes. Everything we do, we watch through our worldly eyes. So today, what you're seeing, you think is normal, but in in the spiritual sense of the word, you're seeing everything upside down. What we see is upside down. What the world is going through is upside down. That's not the the way God ever created the world to be. God created it to be like Eden, the perfect right side up world. But what the world is experiencing today is an upside down world. But they think it is what? Right side up. That when you introduce them to Eden, am I talking to somebody? When you introduce them to what it's supposed to be like, you know what they say? These people are coming into our world and turning it upside down. You see the irony? But the matter of fact is they don't know that even though they think that we're turning it upside down, we're turning it right side up because that's always how Jesus intended for it to be. The cross of Calvary was a way for this upside down world to be transformed and changed into a right side up world, what God intended it to be originally. As the worship team leads us in a time of worship, there are certain convictions that you and I need to arrive at today. I want some of us to make some decisions in our heart. I want some of us to identify the world that we're in, the people that we're in relationship with. It could be a boss. It could be somebody that you know. It could be a non-Christian. It could be an unbeliever. It could be an atheist. It could be starting to pray for them. But don't stop there. Don't just say, I'm going to pray for people. Please do something about it. Start the conversation. You already have their audience. You already have an influence over them. They will give you two minutes of their time. Oh, it's going to take time. Don't worry about it. For for Paul, it took three Sabbaths. It's okay. It's going to take time. But in and through that, make sure that you are using every opportunity you get to be an influence in somebody's life, that you can share about this life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ.
as we worship the Lord, as we give a few minutes, as the worship team leads us in worship. I want us to just worship today. Would you stand up to your feet? And I'm going to come back and I'm going to pray and close.